Merci You're Paul. welcome. I'm, uh, I'm going to hope that was a nice introduction, otherwise I could have just been well and truly punked there. Um, my name's Rob Bishop, I'm an engineer and evangelist for the uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, we're a not-for-profit educational charity based in Cambridge in the UK, and we make this, which is the Raspberry Pi. It's uh, a cheap, it's $25, uh, open computing platform designed initially for kids, but uh, in reality for people of all ages to learn and experiment and tinker and, uh, and build things and, and to get back into programming. Uh, there's a lot of talk here about platforms, you know, utilizing the web, utilizing what technology we have. Uh, one of the issues is that, certainly in the UK, but we've also seen other, uh, other countries, you know, we're not producing the next generation of engineers who are going to be able to build on those technologies, who are going to be able to further them. You know, we, we have a, uh, it's an often used phrase, but we have a generation of uh, sort of uh, users, not creators. Uh, which is a bit of a worry. So, uh, who here actually has a Raspberry Pi? Okay, who here sells Raspberry Pis? I certainly know there's a couple of you. <laughs> so, so, for those of you who don't know what it is, um, basically it, it is a computer. It's essentially a smartphone without the, the radio. It's uh, got an SD card slot, uh, much like your camera would do, that's where the memory comes from. Uh, you power it via a mobile phone charger, just like you might do for your Android mobile phone. And you plug it into your TV via HDMI, just like you might do your Xbox. And essentially, you know, what can you do from there? Well, you power it up, and it gives you a command line. It's a bit like the old BBC Basic or the Spectrums uh, that some of you might have grown up with. Uh, and it takes you back to, uh, to that age where actually computing was experimental. You know, we, we've got to a point now where computers prompt you what you want to do. You know, it's sort of like the, uh, the Clippy generation, where it's, you know, do you want to do this? I think you should do this. Rather than, you know, a blank command line console, which is not going to do anything unless you tell it to, uh, and which is a very different um, sort of uh, in interaction paradigm, which we're, we're losing somewhat. I was going to talk a little bit about, uh, I saw your tagline was, be inspired and be brave. Uh, and I guess there's, there's two ways that that really, uh, that really, um, fits with, with our experience with Raspberry Pi. Uh, inspiration. Inspiration is very important to us. As I say, what we're trying to do with the Raspberry Pi is inspire the next generation. We want to show them that they can make cool things. They don't just have to buy them. You know, we want to show them that if they want their computers to do something different, if they want a door lock that is activated by knocking a certain pattern, if they want a, uh, a robot, or they even want to just take some pictures from space, you know, that actually you can go and do that. And we've seen uh, loads of projects on our blog which uh, have been made by other people, by other engineers, uh, people in their free time and weekends, but also as part of their day-to-day -day jobs, that, you know, we can show to these kids and we can say, look, you can do this. Those projects that you always thought you had to buy or were expensive, you can go and make them, and you can make them with things you can buy online. So that's the inspiration part. So the other part is, is be brave. So uh, brave, I guess, is when we thought we were going to sell 10,000 units, and we launched to have a, a global <laughs> sale of over 100,000 units in pre-orders. That was brave. Brave was the fact that actually what we managed to do was spurn up a lot more interest just by the tagline of having a $25 computer than we could ever fulfill. <laughs> and so suddenly we had to uh, re, uh, we had to reset up our entire deployment strategy. We had to work with distributors, we had to um, get much larger manufacturing pipelines in place in order to uh, satisfy the demand we have. And it's only now that we're actually getting to the point where we're not having stock outages. Uh, last week we released a, a camera module that works for the Raspberry Pi, and we sold 10,000 units in 12 hours worldwide. You know, this is the problem. You are global businesses from day one. And uh, social media is all very well and good, but what happens if you market it so well that you can't fulfill it? And that was the problem that, that we ended up facing. It's a good problem to have, but it's, uh, it's, it's still a problem. And it is really great that we have this global community. You know, if you go on our forums, uh, the, the customer's not just someone who's purchasing our product, but they're also actively involved in, in effectively developing it. You know, we, we ship out the software in a very rough and ready form, and the community gets the feedback, and you know, all of the software's open and available online, and they get to be involved in the development. You know, they're sort of uh, buying into the, uh, the ideals, they're buying into what we're trying to do, 
And it, it kind of feels like a joint venture with our customers rather than being the traditional setup where we're selling something to them. Uh, and it's a, it's a really satisfying place to be. I get to do a lot, a lot of talks like this, and it's always really great to go and meet people, and they're thrilled to have your product. You know, it's nice to work for a, a company where people are really glad that you're doing what you're doing. And I think that's because, uh, A, we have you know, uh, very straightforward aims in that we think kids, more kids should be programming and that we're working towards that. And secondly, that it's set up for a charity. You know, it's much easier to go and ask uh, customers sort of feedback and support if they know that actually we're kind of all in it together and we're all working for this uh, sort of higher cause and mission. And that's, that's certainly very satisfying. So I say, you know, th this is a computer. What have people done with it? So I was saying before, you know, you can do things like uh, an, an amateur uh, rocketry uh, guy back in the UK has attached one to some weather balloons and he sent it up higher than Felix Baumgartner jumped from and relayed uh, some pictures from the uh, sort of uh, low Earth atmosphere of, um, of the UK. And that's amazing. You know, they've done that with less than 100 pounds worth of gear. You know, he just went and did that. You know, we see kids who are making robots, who are hosting their own websites, who are creating things. You know, and you even see younger kids doing this. We have a generation now which have grown up with apps. And it's really interesting when you go and see these sort of uh, 11 or 12-year-olds who, they're very familiar with iPads, they're very familiar with creating content. But when you suddenly say, hey, you know that game idea that you've always wanted to play? You know, the one with sort of cats fighting each other with laser beams or something that no one's made? Because you know how imaginative ch children are. Well, you can make that. You know, you don't have to sit around and lament that it doesn't exist. You can go and make that happen. And that's, that's really empowering. And it's great to see these kids, you know, when you have siblings, where one of them's written a game, and their, other, you know, their brother or sister can go and play it. And that's really cool. That's really empowering. And, and that's what we want to do. I mean, this, in some ways, is sort of the anti-iPad. You know, the iPad is about delivering digital content as effectively as possible. You know, Apple don't want you to have any awareness of the device that you're using. They just want it to be you and the content. And they, they kind of want the device to be as, as intuitive as to be transparent. Now, that's great if what you want to do is deliver digital content. But it's terrible if you want to inspire a new generation of engineers or to get people to want to be interested in how it's being delivered. Because if you obscure it, then you take away the mystery. You know, you take away the devices. It's not even in people's consciousness. They're not even thinking about how that happens. It just happens, and they enjoy it. This is kind of instant gratification. It's the same problem with developing or creating things uh, sort of on, on Windows or on a Mac. You know, these days, you can boot up a browser and go and watch hours of HD video content at, at a few clicks. You know, in this instant gratification society, if there's no cost or effort barrier to having lots of content you can consume, but you have to go away and either research or pay or download something in order to create, then no wonder we have kids who don't want to do that. And so what we're trying to do is produce something that actually, as I say, is, is the opposite of the iPad. If the iPad's about the content, it's about the end, then the Raspberry Pi is about the journey. You know, what we want to do is put the, the bare circuit board in front of them, which is sometimes the first time kids ever seen uh, a circuit board, particularly with computers these days that are getting uh, more and more closed, and, and say, actually, no, this is how you're getting that content. This is how you're loading a web browser. This is how you're creating a GUI. This is how you're going and, and connecting ro um, motors and making robots. And we want kids to actually think about what it is that they're doing and to put these things in front of them. Uh, there was a great review in, in, a, in a magazine that said, uh, the Raspberry Pi is a great gadget. The problem is you have to learn too much to use it which I kind of thought missed the point. <laughs> you know, that's exactly what we want to achieve. You know, we want to have something where we're almost forcing the user to say, hey, this is a computer. You must tell it what to do. You're going to need to think about what it does in order to make it do something. You know, there's a challenge. Go and create. And creating is very satisfying. You know, we sometimes uh, we forget that engineering is just the art of making stuff. You know, it's, it's part of the, 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 what it is to be human, to want to have some effect on the world. No one wants to just go through life feeling like you know, they've just passed through, they've not actually had any effect on the world around them. And if you want to have an effect on the world around it, you want to mold it, you want to shape it, you want to change it, well, you've got to create stuff and modify stuff and make things. And that's engineering. And it's a very powerful thing. But it's something that we're, uh, you know, we're increasingly, when, when you either have this high effort barrier to go and create these things, or you know, no effort to go and consume all of this content, then, you know, no wonder. And that's a really great thing. And one of the other great things 
is, is the internet, which has empowered makers and people who create things to share it. You know, you think before the internet, all of these people who in their bedrooms are making little robots or making, um, you know, door locks activated by knocking or whatever it is that they're doing, you know, they would only be able to share that kind of with word of mouth, maybe in a magazine if they were lucky. And if they wanted other people to see their products, you know, they'd have to go and get distributors or patents or whatever they'd have to do to try and get someone to actually manufacture it so that other people can see it. You know, you think of today, you have kids in their bedrooms who write some cool code, they post it online, goes up on Hacker News or Reddit or our blog or somewhere, and then suddenly the world's seen it. You know, you can share that instantly. And suddenly you have all of this reputation at, at no cost without having done anything. You know, we, we spent actually no money on marketing, we spent no money on PR, we've literally just done this, we've gone around talking about what we're passionate about, we've, uh, you know, gone and posted on blogs, and it's been the strength of other people who've done cool stuff that's really driven our product. And as I say, it, it drove it so hard that we thought we might sell 10,000 in our first year, if we were lucky, and uh, we sold over a million units. I think, what, about 1.3 million units sold um, with a very small team. You know, I think we'd sold more than half a million units before we even had an office. And, and that's what you can do when really you have something that captures people's imagination, you tie them in, and, uh, and you really use the power of the internet, the power of networking to, to say, look, you know, we can empower you to go and do cool things. Uh, and if you, if you haven't seen the Raspberry Pi, uh, it's our website, I think they, they put it up there before, raspberrypi.org, go and have a look, just see what some of the kids and some of the adults have gone and made. You know, if you really want to be inspired and, uh, and have a free weekend where you want to tinker or create something cool, you know, go and look on the blog, see what people have done. And uh, you know, my challenge is to go and get hold of Raspberry Pi and see what you can do with it, see what you can create. You know, maybe in your office, you'd like to have a dashboard showing the stats of your web store. You know, maybe you want to have uh, you know, a, a siren which plays every time someone buys a product. You know, you can go and do that, right? And then suddenly, rather than being difficult, it's very easy. And you can go and create it, you can put it online, and hey, you even get some extra publicity for having done it. It's a double win, right? Um, so I'd, I'd encourage you, go and do some cool stuff, and, uh, and let us know about it. Thanks, everyone. I have a question. I have a question. Sure. Uh, could I use a Raspberry Pi to run a web shop? Definitely. So um, the Raspberry Pi actually makes a, a very good hosting platform. There's also a number of uh, web hosting providers that do free uh, co-location. Um, I think there's one in, in Sweden, actually. I can't remember the details. But if you look on the blog, it'll be there. Um, where, of course, because these things consume so little power and take up so little space, that the uh, hosting providers are willing to uh, co-locate them for free. You, know, you send them their Pi, they'll put it in their, in their uh, hosting, and suddenly you've got a website. Um, things like Django run very well. I mean, one of the benefits of this being based on Linux is, you know, whatever middleware you're using, whatever server, you can probably run it on the Pi, and someone's probably done it. So any Nginx, all of the big ones uh, have been seen to run, um, and lots of people have done it. You know, and it's great for, for kids in their bedrooms. They can go and set up their own sort of e-commerce platform mm. or whatever just in their own home. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great way to go and start and... You know, I'm looking forward to meeting the first few kids who become millionaires off the back of using the Raspberry Pi to do something. I mean, we might be a charity, but it'd be great to see these other people, you know, this, this new generation of, uh, of entrepreneurs. You know, we've seen a lot of entrepreneurs come through with the internet. You know, suddenly when uh, high-speed internet connections became ubiquitous, um, we've seen a lot of, of web entrepreneurs. I think now hardware is getting very cheap and very accessible. I think the next generation is going to be makers and hardware entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. It's going to be people who, who make cool things, and that's, that's good for all of us. Mm. Any questions from you, Anders? Yeah, I want to get back to, you, you talked fastly about how you, how you launched this, but how did you really do it? How did you build traction? So, I mean, you had, yeah. you, you come from nothing. I yeah, know. so I guess we, I mean, we built traction because, um, you know, our price was our major selling point. You know? By having something that is the cheapest thing you can buy, by a significant margin, as it was at the time, and still is, um, you know, that, that kind of sold itself in many ways. You know, suddenly, you can buy a computer for 25 bucks. You, know, you kind of get this good enough. You know, sure, it's not the most powerful computer you can buy. You know, for 10 times that, you could buy a much more powerful machine. But actually, it's good enough for most instances. Mm -hmm. you know, let's say you're at school and you want to go and have a weather station in your back garden, uh, in your fields. Yeah? You're not going to want to spend uh, you know, 
$2,000 on a MacBook or $250 on a, on a Dell PC or something to put that in a field. You know, actually, you can spend $25, mm. and suddenly that's good enough. And actually, there was a lot of latent desire for people who wanted this kind of uh, technology, who were waiting for these things to become cheap enough that they could go and experiment. I mean, it's, it's the price of a textbook. You know, the point is, is that we want uh, parents to be able to buy these with their kids and say, hey, there you go, go and experiment. Mm -hmm. And if you break it, you know, it's 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. It's not 250. Mm -hmm. And so it just becomes a toy for play and experimentation. Thank you, Rob, for coming. And thank you for making Christopher so happy. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.